All right, Connor? Have you ever looked up and felt a sudden surprise at where you are? I think it's just sunk in that I'm a year out from home. Only every day. You'll get used to it. Raymond Manor. Raymond God says, speak softly around the Lord's daughter, Linette. She's sensitive. Lord Raymond may seem like a harsh man, but is also fair and generous. Lord Raymond doesn't like it when his guards chat with visitors too long. Raymond's servant says, Lord Raymond doesn't like it when his servants talk to his guests. I've never been outside of Defiance Bay. I'm very lucky to be a part of this household. Shouldn't you be speaking to Lord Raymond? The labels, all perfectly angled outward, boast an array of fine vintages. However, they're all coated in dust. Linette Raymond says, Father never reads to me. He's always busy with his own books. My favorite is the story about Galawain's beasts. The biggest always eats the smallest. Linette stares at her fingers as she slowly links them together. She looks like an adult, but I get the impression she speaks like a child, because why would she want her father to read stories to her? I thought it's uh, a favorite pastime for children, or maybe the tradition is different in the Raymond family. I'll handle this. It's done. The ledger lists quantities of wheat, copper, and weird wool. A deep crease along the spine suggests 
that the book never closes. The skins are so bright and the end red. It looks as if someone has taken the time to polish each fruit individually. Yeah, the servants, who else? Springs of dried lavender and rosemary infuse the kitchen with a fresh aroma. Raymond Servant says, the master and his guards don't take kindly to uninvited guests. So what are they going to do about it? Why don't they kick me out? I'm confused. The servant pauses from his task to bow, avoiding eye contact. Raymond Servant, the old serving woman regards you with bleary eyes, begging your, begging your pardon, but I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to return downstairs. Visitors aren't permitted on the upper floor. Should I backhand her? I'm confused. No, I am. What I mean is, I don't know what to do. Alright, I'm just going to sate my curiosity. I'm going to quick save first, then I'm going to backhand her. But that's not what I want to do. So after I do that, I will quick load again and not backhand her. Raymond Servant says, Visitors still aren't permitted up here. Please return downstairs. Aris Mittal backhands the servant. Raymond Servant collapses without a sound. Oh, it turns to combat. I wonder if I go back downstairs. Will the other guards attack me or not? <laughs> Let's find out. Oh, they're not attacking me. Well, let's... We're already waist deep. Wet. Why not dive?
Though exquisitely crafted, this love seat feels stiff and uncomfortable. What is a love seat? A seat for making love? A sex chair? Oh, the servant sleeps soundly. This is the masterwork of a famous Aydiran painter. I'll handle this. It's done. These apples look too vividly crimson to be real. Fake apples, then? This is where we came, when we were stealing the gem. I see. Gods keep you. Lord Raymond holds a shipping manifest in his well manicured hands. Despite his expensive clothes, he has the sallow complexion and restless air of a man who devotes all of his days and most of his nights to work. If you have business to discuss, make an appointment with my attendant. I don't have time for unexpected visitors. Aris Mittal says, tell me about yourself. Lord Raymond snaps the pages in his hands. I am lord of this house and not prone to idle chatter. If you have no business here, I suggest you be off. He doesn't look up from his papers. Hail, traveler. Lord Raymond sighs and shuffles a stack of papers. You again, Arismito says farewell. I hope Lord Raymond doesn't suspect me as the killer of his guards and the one who backhanded one of his servant.
Each plate and utensil has been polished to a spotless shine. The thin stemmed goblets ring melodiously at the strike of a fingernail. Noble says the sooner Lord Raymond commits his crazy daughter to the sanitarium, the better. Oh, so Linette Raymond is crazy. I see. Or maybe she just has a stunted development. It, it could be. Maybe she's not crazy. Maybe she just has a difficult mental development, perhaps. Tristuana. The young elf is dressed in gaudy robes that he seems ready to cast off. He picks up, he picks at a heavily brocaded sleeve and continually adjusts the gold chain around his neck. He looks up at you. Did she send you to run me out of town? You can tell her I'm not going anywhere without that medallion. I told Cyril I wouldn't let her sell it. If that's what you're here about, then save yourself the trouble. Thristuan puffs up his chest, but glances at the exit. Hmm, Cyril, isn't she the prostitute at Salty Mast, the one I had to pay so expensively, and all, and all I got is just a blank screen? The devs suck. Aris Mittal. Hmm, what should I choose here? Aris Mittal says, I'm not after you, but maybe I can help. Tristuana pulls at a shining button as a relief, but I don't see how. Cyril's a courtesan over at the Salty Mast, in Ondra's gift. We've been working together for over a year now. I find a noble with more money than sense, fill him up with liquor, and send him her way. They have a good time, and Cyril takes her fee, and a little extra. Thristuan rubs his fingers together. A hundred coppers here, a trinket there. It's a bounty for us, and these lords and ladies never notice anything missing. Hmm. Aris Mittal says, no harm done then. Thristuan says, anyway, we always split the bounty until a week ago. Tristuan squeezes his lip, his lips into a tight frown. She takes a necklace off some noble. It's an Anguithan medallion, dang near priceless. That relic is sacred to my clan, but she won't part with it for any sum I could afford. Tristuan tugs at the gold chain around his neck. And even if I wanted to, I can't go home without it. Sagani's brow burrows in pity. That's a hard thing. Aris Mittal says. Tell me more about your situation. Tristuan picks at the hem of his sleeve. What do you want to know? Aris Mittal asks. What makes this medallion so important to you? Tristuan says, I grew up in Eir Glanfath with the Shattering Spear clan. We Glanfathans have protected Anguithan ruins for thousands of years. It is the one duty the gods ask of us in exchange for the freedom to live as we please. Tristuan fidgets with an emerald ring on his pinky. 
but treasure hunters looted the ruins in our territory, and we left the wilds. We'd dwelled in for generations. Most of my clanmates scattered to towns around the Deerwood, and probably live on crusts of bread. Ristuan looks at his embroidered robes with disgust. Restoring this medallion to the ruins would earn us the gods' forgiveness. The shattering spear could go home. Kana says, this is all rather fascinating. A single medallion to earn the gods' favor and so return home. It rather reminds me of her. A story I heard somewhere. Arismitel says, Tell me about Serel. Tristuan says, She's a courtesan at the salty mast over in Ondra's gift. She wasn't born too much, but she's done what she has to in order to escape that. Tristuan's gazes at a string of amber beads around his wrist. What were the beads used for, I wonder? Hmm? I hope it wasn't used for anal play. That would be dirty. If you put it on your hand. Tristuan says she's a good friend. He folds his arm in his trailing, wrinkled sleeves. Without her, I'd probably be leaving hand to mouth like the rest of the shattering spear. But this isn't about her or me. It's about the 40 people in my clan and the way of life we've held to for generations. Arismitel says, You seem like you've done well enough for yourself. Thiristuana clenches his heavily, adorned hands. It was this or scraped by in the gutters, like the rest of my clan. But I'd give it all for that medallion. I offered to, but it's worth more than anything I've got, and Serel knows it. Arismito says, I still don't understand why you cannot take your money and return to Eirglan path. Thristuan sighs, arching his neatly plucked eyebrows. That's because you're used to looking at things with detachment. A community isn't a place, it's a connection to history and meaning. Tristuan makes circles with his wrist, like an anchor, defending the ruins for the gods gave us a purpose. Without that, we are adrift. Does this make any sense to you? Arismitol says, I'm not sure yet. Tristuan looks at you almost with pity. I don't know how else to explain it. Arismitol says that's all I wanted to ask. Tristuan says, so will you help me get the medallion? Arismitol says, I'll see about getting the medallion from Serel. Tristuan says, you'll find her at the salty mast. The only way anyone sees her these days is by paying. So you'll have to go through my, uh... Tristuan fidgets with his sleeve. You are persuasive enough that you might be able to show her my side of things. But, whatever you do, please don't hurt her. Understudy says, on one, two. There was a fair maid from Anchinze. A wanderer from southern lands. Though she set all the lads to a frenzy. 
towards my heart she held in her hands. And though it may splinter my soul, I will, her I will not. Dang was the line. La oh, just arm warming up. The scripts and props belong to a production of the most unfortunate tale of Pavia and Bernat. I'm here. Gods keep you. Abelhart Skerion. The man is dressed in neat but functional clothes. His sun-wrinkled skin and limber musculature reflect a life spent in the wilderness. Well, Matt, what brings you to the charred barrel? Addis Mittal asks, is this your place? Skerion says, it's my retirement. He thumbs the bar. Used to be a warehouse back when Breckenbury saw more ship traffic, but it fell out of use when the area became mostly residential. I inherited it from some great uncle who'd never had any luck owning it off on my cousins. Now is the most popular spot in Breckenbury. The nobles come to unwind and Keith from other districts come to mingle. Skerion leans closer. We get a few rough types too, but they behave in here. Besides, their coins as good as anyone else's. Arismital asks, who are you? Skerion says, I was a cartographer for the Duke for decades. He rubs his neatly stubbled cheek crossed the White March half a dozen times and mapped most of the ruins of Thainabog. Skerion greens flashing a gold tooth. A good career, but one suited to younger men. When I came back to Defiance Bay for good, Cleaver and a few other friends in the Knights helped me get the rights to refurbish this place. There's a strong ale quality entertainment and a fresh sea breeze. Skerion raises a mug. What more could a man want? Aris Mittal. Hmm, okay, so Aris... The rest of the options are asking for menu, hiree, and rooms. Okay. Hail and well met. Well met, friend. Noble says, good evening to you. Lord and Gaderman, I never would have believed it. Indeed.
cook says, please don't track dirt into my kitchen. The patrons here are particular. I have to get the fire just right for pigeon pie. Come back for one of our dinner shows. Dinner show, you said. Are you a... Are you... De dealing in gastronomy? Oh yeah, I've been down here, I forgot. Let's go upstairs to the second floor. This map charts routes through the White March. The captain takes her shore leave with the rest of us, says the pirate. Tell me, where is your captain mired with? What happened at the lighthouse? And what happened afterwards? Spill the beans. Tell me everything. I love seeing the looks on those nobles' faces when we show up says the pirate. It seems he's ignoring my inquiries. Okay then. An examital water jug fashioned from white clay. Upon watching this item, Aris Mittal thinks about his homeland and his nobility status. This ashtray is painted with colorful waves and horns in the style of Rawatai. This map of the Deerwood and Erglan path appears to predate the discovery of some of the ruins in the east. It's signed by the cartographer Abelhard Skerion. I'll have this open in no time. It's done. Noble says, it was an interesting show, that's all I can really say. Come on, you can tell me more, just one thing please. Sorry, I promise, Gaderman. Let's not talk about this here, alright? 
Who is this Gaderman? He is a lord, right? One of the NPC refers to this name with a lord. Lord Gaderman. What shows is he hosting? Is it illegal that this noble doesn't want to talk about it here? Wait, the barrier to the sea, is it Andra? Adra stones? Oh, it seems Colfedge is alright. So the coins I left you. As have you put it to good use? For medications, I bet. And what else? You've made your point, please go. Yeah, I apologize for what I did. But I'm glad at least my coin can get you back to health. And I hope whatever's left will be able to help you during the coming days. I've had Ijima. But you can't talk to him. My standards changed around year two. What did Aloth say? Aloth says, you've been on your own for five years? Sagani says, I've had Itumak. Aloth says, but you can't talk to him. Sagani says, my standards change around year two. Okay. Did you also do bestiality with your fox or wolf? I hope not, because that would be cheating. But I guess it would be a good show. Just kidding. Who said these things? The crier? Magran turns a favorable eye upon our fair city. The purification fires burn once more. Yup, thanks to Aris Mittal and his companions. Why didn't they sing of Aris's name for his feet and achievements? 
We give thanks knowing that Divine B will persevere through any hardship. According to Kuren, there is someone I can speak to in the Salty Mast about the case of the disappearing people. What is the name again? I forgot. Is this the one, Oli? Oli, the man is at a table by himself, but he constantly glances at the opposite bench as if waiting for someone. He reeks of alcohol and he moves with the torpor of someone who's gotten used to spending most of his time drunk. Oli says, this table's taken fun another. He spreads his elbows on the wood and pulls his drink between them. Aris Mittal asks, I've got questions about Landry. Oli's face twists into a confused skull. What's it to you? Aris Mittal says, I'm your new drinking buddy and I've got questions for you. Aris Mittal finish Oli's drink. Oli stares you, stares at you flabbergasted. Well then, ask away. Oli says, so, what was it you were wanting with Landry? Aris Mittal says, Tell me about Landry. Oli says, he spent most of his time here drinking with me. Tells you enough, doesn't it? Oli takes a gulp of his drink and shrugs. He didn't volunteer details, and I didn't ask, but he had a working man's hands and a working man's taste for drink. Aris Mittal asks, when and where did you last see Landry? Oli says, right here, getting drinks with me. Oli slaps a spot on the bench. Just like we have every night for the last five years. I couldn't actually tell you much about him, and I think he preferred it that way. Oli frowns at the rough wood grain of the table. It's probably why we got on so well. Plenty of things we didn't talk about. Anyway, I remember that night because he said things were finally turning around. He was going to find a steady job, clean up, have another crack at the respectable life. I told him in that case, he could buy the drinks. Oli traces the rim of his cup. That's when she showed up. Aris Mittal asks, who's this woman you're talking about? A sly smile stretches across Oli's face. A real fancy lady named Slumdala. Oli taps his head. I don't remember much these days, but I remember her. Usually you have to pay a month's copper to spend time with a woman like that. But Lumdala, Oli shakes his head. She was falling all over Landry that night, left with him too. 
Okay, I came across Lumdala near the amphitheater. Elega also told me that Kendall got in with an, with an acting troupe. So already two witnesses tells a story that leads to Lumdala, or at least the acting troupe. Interesting. Aris Mittal asks, where did Lendri and Lumdala go? A gruff laugh rattles Oli's throat. She said they were going on to see some frilly performance. If you ask me, they had their own plans to perform that night. Oli makes an obscene gesture and grins. She just said they had to pick something up at her house in Copper Lane first. Some cozy little place by the northern gate. Oli picks up his cup. Even a drunk like me knows what that means. For what it's worth, she said she earns her coin over at that amphitheater in Copper Lane. That's where she said they were going to see their show. Maybe someone there saw him. Aris Mittal says, that's all I need to know right now. Oli nods. Right, let me, let me know if you find him, yeah. Because that bastardo owes me a round if he's found a good life. Alright, so I spoke to Elega and Oli. Who is the third individual I need to speak to, according to Kuren? Let's consult the journal. I've spoken to Elega. Oh, it's not Elega. It's Elja. Elja, not Elega. All right. It's Elja. Like Colfedge. Elja. Laura is a merchant in Copper Lane. Okay. Let's go speak to Laura now. Hey, you think we could get another dog? Keep this one company? Just a thought. What are you saying, Eder? We have two dogs already following us. Two dogs, two cats, one little dragon. What more do you ask? Two dogs, right? 
No, three dogs. We have three dogs. Three dogs, two cats and one little dragon. These postings show current prices for a range of commodities and they track the running exchange rate for the Violian Luce. Violin soldier says, Welcome to the Violin Embassy. You have business with the republics. Violian diplomat says, being assigned to the embassy in Defiance Bay is an immense honor. Local politics only matter if they disrupt the flow of trade. The republics will more than welcome any of Defiance Bay's animancers if animancy were to be banned. What houses for Vailian cuisine in the city is pathetic. How do you do? Vice Nagosti says, Aimiko, so good to see you again. What can I do for you? Aris Mittal says, Aligina said you could use my help with something. Vichen Agosti says, of course, of course, word has reached my ears how you cross blades with the Doemanels, and yet here you are still, quite impressive, Verzano was most fortunate you came along. But on to business, a rather notorious adventuring party calling themselves the Forgotten have made a name for themselves by raiding Angwithan ruins in the deer wood and selling the stolen relics to their patrons back in the Vailian republics. I need them stop. I'm sure you are aware that trade in Angwithan relics is strictly forbidden in the deer wood. Were it known that prominent nobles in the republics were flagrantly defying the duke's ban on the looting of Angwithan ruins, it would put a number of valuable trade agreements in jeopardy, or even cost the fines bay to embargo Vailian goods. I cannot let that happen. Aris Mittal asks, the authorities in Defiance Bay have no idea this smuggling is going on? Vichen Agosti says, I'm sure rumors have reached their ears. But if they suspected that there was any truth to them, they'd have summoned me before them. That hasn't happened yet. Aris Mittal asks, why not just have the forgotten killed? Vichen Agosti shakes his head. I hear the town criers now. Vailian ambassador hires assassins. No, that option is too risky for me. Aris Mittal says, I'll help. What do you need me to do? Vichen Agosti smiles in relief. Thank you. A prominent merchant in the republics, Mestre Abarakozi, has also developed an interest in obtaining Angwithan relics and sent a buyer to Defiance Bay to meet with the Forgotten. I arranged for the Knights of the Crucible 
to detain the buyer for questioning. I may have suggested that the buyer was a wanted criminal. I'll need you to go in the buyer's place posing as Barakosi's representative and learn how the Forgotten are smuggling the relics through Defiance Bay. With that knowledge, I can take steps to discreetly dismantle their operation and discredit them in the eyes of their patrons. If there's nothing else, I must return to my duties. Wait, so I'm going to pose as the real buyer. What happened to the original buyer then? You're going to s you're going to feed him to the Crucible Knights, while the patrons back in Vilia are safe and fed. Hmm, such is life. It sucks. But here we go. If there's nothing else, I must return to my duties, says Vicen Agosti. Go to Idelwan Bridge. Thank you. 
A league of pain. Sis, did you find my grimoire? Arismital, sis. Moedra told me about your experiments. Hmm, maybe number two. I spoke to Moedred. He doesn't have your grimoire. Elik lets out a bubbling hiss of frustration. There's not much fun in a joke if you have to explain it, is there? I was certain you of all people could appreciate a little jape. Elig tugs a few hairs out of his beard. If you can't fulfill my need for vengeance, then you'll have to serve another purpose. A dried and shriveled tongue darts over his cracked lips. I'm afraid a fierce hunger was awakened along with me. Oh well. Amulet. This brilliant bloodstone amulet has a strange aura about it. As you hold the gem, you think you hear a woman's voice. A soul prowls within the bloodstone like a caged Stelgaier. It's filled with a fierce, restless energy. Arismital asks, Who are you? You see an image in your mind of a woman in heavy leather armor bearing twin daggers. Next to her is a man, young and handsome, who calls her Rowena. Ah. The vision shifts to a windswept plain next to a lake. Fifty men and women in matching leathers lay dead, their bodies contorted and deformed by some sinister sorcery. Rowena falls among them, her body collapsing next to the young man you saw earlier. She's too weak to speak, but the name Dalton appears in your mind. A lone figure strides across the battlefield, barely bothering to step over the corpses. His eyes are filled with an unnatural light and fixed on Rowena. He reaches out to her, and what little life remains in her body departs. When he takes the amulet from around her neck, you feel her anguished soul trapped within it. With a final contemptuous glance at the fallen Dalton, the man departs. Hmm, fifty men and women got marked by Helig, but it took only six individuals to kill Helig now. I can see why I have a theory. During the battle with the 50 men and women, Halig was in his full strength. The current Halig, the current version of Halig, is, is nothing like his former self. He was killed, remember? He was killed by Moedred and reanimated. Maybe after he got killed and reanimated, his power is no longer it once was. Aris Mittal is lucky to have fought Helig in this condition. If he fought the 50 men slayer Helig, maybe Aris Mittal would not survive. Aris Mittal asks, What do you want? You see an image of the amulet shattering and the soul inside rising and dissipating among the stars. You want to be free? Aris Mittal says, Dalton sent me to find you. Yeah, I have a contract to honor. The soul pulses with warm. It fills your mind with memories of a young man who's both bold and generous. But fury and despair gnaw those images away until all you can feel are cold, crimson walls pressing against you 
and something loathsome feeding off you as the years fade into decades. Iris Mittal says farewell. Return to Dalton in Copper Lane. Don't bother the caddy, Tamak. You'd have better odds against a Stelgar. I almost walked past you, and then I realized you have a name, so I return. Who is this guy? Sendrik. A red faced young man approaches you. He appears livid and stammers as he speaks. You. You killed my beloved. This will. This will not stand. Your beloved, who? Dana? Aris Mittal says, Your beloved, what are you talking about? Ah, yes, it's Dana. Sendrix, Sendrix's face darkens and he snarls. Dana and I were to be wed. You will pay for your insolence. Okay, what I don't get it, what I don't get is, how could anyone know I killed Dana? I killed all Dana's thugs, no one escaped, at least not that I'm aware of. Hmm, I think the guards has loop loose lips. Yeah, the warehouse guards, they fought alongside me, right? Those bastardos, loose lips sink ships. And now I have to sink them to the bottom of the ocean, but maybe not. Is the Crucible Knights really lose control of the city? Imagine some people can go attack other people in broad daylight like this without fear of repercussions. And one more thing. Why is it that Sendrik wants to kill me because I killed Dana? But Dana's own family, Abrekan, Brikanta, don't even question my action of killing Dana. If Sendrik knows about what I did, surely the Dominos know about it too, right? And yet they didn't say anything about me killing Dana. <sighs> I'm confused.
Hello! Dalton's tired eyes brighten. Did you find her? Aris Mittal. Hmm. Aris Mittal shows him the amulet. Yes, but not as you expected. The old man studies the amulet. Rowena used to wear this. Where did you get it? Aris Mittal says. From Hellig, which kept her soul trapped inside it for decades. It's time to set her free. Dalton's eyes widen in a horror. No, please. After searching for her for so long, Dalton gazes at the amulet, just to have her close to me, to visit her in my dreams. That would be enough. All right, Dalton. Iris Mittal agreed to help you to find Rowena. But he never agreed for anything else. He found Rowena. And he is not beholden to your next request. Aris Mittal says, Enough for you, but what about her? If you'd keep her trapped in this amulet, for the sake of your own comfort, you're no better than the wizard who imprisoned her. Dalton's expression withers. You are right. Please, let me do it. Dalton draws a club with a trembling hand and crushes the amulet. As the gem cracks, you feel essence rush from it. The old man looks at the shattered gemstone. Thank you for showing me reason. Perhaps she'll wait for me in the next life. He looks at his hands shaking. By the flame, she won't have to wait long. Why? Do you think you're gonna kick the bucket soon? Dalton says, please take this. He hands you the club. It's from my old adventuring days. I think it's time I finally let them go. Yeah, and one more thing. I hope this might, if it's any consolation, I will have to tell you. Halig was murdered by his colleague, and he reanimated, and I killed him again. I hope that is enough for you to find peace. It won't bring Rowena back, I know. Thank you. My Rowena and I can finally have peace, says Dalton. Hmm. Good day to you. Laura says, always good to see a familiar face. How can I help you? Aris Mittal says, I'm looking into some disappearances. I hear that your sister's gone missing. Oh, her sister. Laura says, I... Her voice drops to a whisper. I didn't think anyone would help me. When Cora disappeared... I tried to do read a row, the crucible knights, even the dozens here. She points her thumb at the large building behind her. No one had time to look for a missing girl then. She bites her lip. That was three weeks ago. If there is anything I can tell you that will help, just ask. Aris Mittal says, tell me about Cora. Laura says, she's my younger sister, always had a head full of dreams. 
she was convinced there was something special waiting for her, that she'd be remembered and happy and important. Laura shakes her head. She's got plenty of heart but not the commitment to match. Still, when she got that theater job, I thought she was about to turn around. Aris Mittal asks, what was Cora doing around the time she disappeared? Laura says, she just gotten into this acting troupe called the... The... Laura's brows knit. Aris Mittal says, you know this. Concentrate. Laura says, the revel of stars, that's it. She was pretty inexperienced, Laura hesitates. I think that's why she was so excited to get a role. I'm afraid I don't know anything else about it. Aris Mittal asks, when and where did you last see your sister? Laura says, she was at our house, getting ready for her big performance. That was three weeks ago. Aris Mittal asks, did you see Cora with anyone when she disappeared? Laura says she was, is, very sociable. She's always enjoyed crowds. I'm afraid I can't narrow it down beyond that. Aris Mittal says, that's all I need to know right now. Laura puts both hands over her heart. You don't know how much time, you don't know how much this means to me, just to know that someone's actually looking for her. Anything else I can do for you? Aris Mittal says, nothing and leaves. Question Lumdala in Copper Lane. Yeah. Welcome. Lumdala says, I really should spend this time getting into character. Aris Mittal says, I was wondering if a woman named Cora was part of your group. Lumdala says, I can say I recognize the name. She suddenly seems focused on the length of her fingernails. Aris Mittal says, That's odd. Her sister says she was part of the Revel of Stars. Lumdala says, Maybe. But what should I know about it? My work requires great focus and attention. She flicks her fingertips in frustration. I don't have time to coach every young amateur who joins our troupe for a week. I suppose I can spare a moment for a fan, Aris Mittal says. I'm looking for Kendall. Apparently he joined your group. No experience, terrible actor. Sounds familiar. Lumdala narrows her silvered eyes. I'm not sure who this Kendall is and why you would malign our talent. But rest assured that we have a process for evoking a satisfying performance from even the most in inexperienced players. Aris Mittal says, Oli said his friend Landry was last seen with you. Lumdala lets out a big laugh. That drunk in Ondra's gift, men flatter themselves when it comes to the attention of a beautiful woman. The pallid knight herself could waltz into that bar, and he'd believe she was there to sit on his lap and listen to body stories. Eder says, The pallid knight. I think I courted her once. She hated being called that. Huh? Eder knows the pallid knight? Okay, Eder, tell me, who is this pallid knight? And you courted her. Who is she? And tell me the whole story. 
how is the courting went. Anis Mittal says, I'm just analyzing the facts. Lumdala says, and the facts are that one of us thinks of cheap ale and desperation while the other has a long and illustrious career. Lumdala tilts her head toward you. Consider well which is a more credible source. Allah says, Okay, it's Iselmir. Iselmir says, Ay, I can't resort, not to be trusted. Sorry, guys. Lumdala says, Surely, there is someone else you can ask about all of this. I'm but a humble actor. Aris Mittal says, You're connected to three recent disappearances that you claim to know nothing about. Lumdala says, Then what else do you expect me to say on the subject? She sighs and turns her face to the, to the sky. If you'll excuse me, I have a performance to attend to. Kadal, the young man steps up next to you, his gaze fixed on the other actors, his voice low. Meet me in Lumdala's house. I know what's going on. Kadal claps his hands and whistles at the other actors. Well done, well done, indeed. Bravissimo, or is it bravissimo, or bravo? I don't remember. Meet with Kadal. Kadal says we can talk here. Lumdala will get suspicious. Actor says her soul shines bright, her heart is true, but ahead lie greater dangers. The hundred poison arrows of the Crimson Serpent's rangers. Okay, let's go to Lumdala's house. What is his connection with Lumdala? Boyfriend? Husband? Friend? I told you I don't have time for your wild accusation, says Lumdala. Adol, a young man appears before you, trembling and excited. You, I saw you with Lumdala, by the amphitheater. Look, I don't know what your business with her is, but I want out of this mess. I just came by to grab my things. Just let me leave, all right? Aris Mittal says. Take a breath and calm down. Tell me what's going on so I can help. Kadal nods, filling his lungs. Uh, thank you, but there's not much time. Lumdala's out to get me, and I need to get out of here, maybe out of the city. Kadal reaches slowly into a satchel and produces a small key. This opens the door behind you. There's a passage in there leading down to a theater. Kadal shudders. It's easier if you see it for yourself. Kada licks his lips. Since I've helped you, I want your promise that you'll leave my name out of this. Sagani looks at Kadal in disgust. Follow vultures and you're sure to find carrion. Hmm.
Paris Mitchell says, I can't do that. What? Carol says, that I can't let you leave. Huh? Why? Then I can't let you leave, he says. The young man reaches down with a shaking hand for a dagger on his belt. Oh, come on, I don't want to fight you. Kandal, that was foolish. There are six of us and one of you. You should have... You should have not challenged us and use what time you have left to flee and hide if you want. But this... Well... You challenge a fight against six people and you're just by yourself. That's foolish. Assorted plays from all over the world fill these shelves. If I was Kadal, if Aris Mittal said I can't do that, I just... I won't say a thing, I won't do anything. I'll just wait for my... I, I'll just use what, what time I have left. Before my name got dragged into this, and escape whatever it is that he is involved with. Just use the time to escape. Instead of challenging six people in a fight, the odds are stacked against you. Dang it, Kadal. I'll handle this. It's done. Nestled between tin helms and breastplates are a handful of daggers that feel too sharp to be props. It's the catacombs. What theater is this? Scarf. A simple silken scarf is crumpled on the filthy black stone. Essence radiates from it, like heat, and the closer you get to it, the more you feel a confusing mixture of joy, surprise, and pain. Pick up the scarf. You hold the scarf and focus on it, and the world around you shifts. Something about you shifts too. The smooth fabric is still in your hands, but you're in a small yet cozy house, and Laura is looking from the scarf back to you, 
asking if you like it. She's smiling because the answer is written on your face. Laura, so this must be the memories of Cora then? That was four years ago, but you still wear the scarf on days like today. After all, you wore it that first day you met the actress with silvered eyes. So who's to say it won't bring you luck again tonight? It's nestled around your throat, soft and warm and comforting. You're halfway through the third act, and you can feel the audience's eyes on you, hungry and attentive. You were nervous at first when that woman brought you down here. You wondered what kind of show you'd signed up for, but this has gone better than you could have hoped. You reach the end of your monologue, and the scarf tightens around your neck. It chokes the final line from your throat, which is embarrassing, because your debut was going so well. But when you try to pull the scarf away, it only tightens further. You're confused, and you look to the audience, expecting someone to rush to your rescue. Then you see their eyes and that hungry, attentive look, and you understand. The stage fades to black. The scarf falls from your hand and flutters to the ground. But Cora so lingers, stuck between a familiar token and a question. It wants to know, but it wants to retreat. I see. An audience of th a theater in the basement in the catacombs. And an, and an audience that did nothing when Cora got choked. I know what this is. This must be a snuff show, right? A show of snuff. Like a snuff film, only it's live in person. Aris Mittal says, You had your sister's love and the courage to follow your dreams. Take comfort in that as you find your way to the next life. The soul glows warmth before fading back into the fabric of the scarf. I didn't expect to came across this theme, a snuff show. What is this? Lumdala? Lumdala emerges from the shadows, her silvered eyes glowing in the darkness. Well, well, if it isn't our friend from Dunrit Row. Wow. Aris Mittal asks, How do you know Dunrit Row hired me? Lumdala says, You aren't the only one who can put two and two together. Lumdala folds her arms and raises her chin. Besides, we actors aren't paid for our discretion, you know. I'm sure Kadal made a fine show of begging you for mercy, but he positively outdid himself when I showed up. It's a shame he wasn't more committed to our craft. A cruel grin crosses her lips. He has always been easy to motivate. Aris Mittal says, What do you want? Lumdala gives you an, an appraising look. I have a proposition. Sagani says, She knows we've got her cornered. Aris Mittal says, I am listening. Lumdala says, I stage my performances for certain wealthy patrons. One in particular would make a valuable catch. You agree to a truce, and I'll give you his name. Aris Mittal says, Explain why this is a better deal for me. Lumdala says, Think of it this way. I only feed a demand. I'm offering you the man whose money and connections made my performances possible in the first place. Aris Mittal, hmm, do I have time to think? Aris Mittal says, I need some time to think it over. 
Lumdala fingers a weapon at her side. This hesitation does not bode well for our deal. I'll give you one more chance. Now make up your mind. Alright, this is a dilemma. Should I let Lumdala go in exchange for the wealthy patron that sponsored this kind of event? Or should I not let her go? But that means I won't be getting the name of the wealthy patron. But I have a guess, actually. Back in First Fires, two noblemen were talking about some kind of a show. And one of them said, I could not believe that a show like that exists or something like that. I don't remember. And the other NPC mentioned the name Lord Gamderan. Gamnerdan, or something like that. Perhaps that lord is one of the sponsors of this snuff show. Ah. Aris Mittal says, All right, I'll do it. Lumdala says, Excellent. The man you're looking for is Lord Gaderman. Find him in Breckenberry yourself, or report him to the authorities. It makes no difference to me. Now it's time we made our exit. Aris Mittal may not be the best of individual, but he's a man of his word, at least for now. So... Yeah. Aris Mittal says, that was the deal. Go. Yeah. A man of his word can also be a flaw, you know. By being a man of his word, Aris Mittal may be honorable in his terms and dealings with Lumdala, but that means he is opening up more chances, more risks of Lumdala continuing doing her thing, meaning Aris Mittal indirectly allows Lumdala to continue with the killing for the show. A man of his word. Being a man of his word is a virtue, I believe. But it can also, but this virtue can also lead to grief if not for you, but for other people. I can't make a statement about this. What is better, to be a man of his word, or to not be a man of his word? In this situation, I'm not sure. But this is how Aris Mittal is. He's just a kith, with all, with all his... positives and his negatives his good points and his flaws it is what it is Aris Mittal says that was the deal go Thank you.
Good day, stranger. Laura says, I always, always good to see a familiar face. How can I help you? Aris Mittal says, I have news about your sister, Cora's dead. Laura says, she, her eyes shimmer with tears. I don't know what to say. I try to keep my hopes up, but I think a part of me already knew. That doesn't make this any easier, though. Laura brushes a tear from one cheek. I can help but think that if someone had looked for her sooner, when I first ask for help, maybe she'd be here. Should I choose option number one or, or option number two? If I choose option number one, I don't know if there's the truth. If I, op if I choose option number two, I don't even know if that's the truth as well. I don't know the truth, whether the authorities are really doing their best, or they're just slacking, I don't know. But I'm not going to say the authorities are doing their best. It seems insensitive to her grief. Maybe I'll choose number two. The authorities here don't care enough about common folk. Their negligence is inexcusable. Laura says, yes, you're right. She wipes her eyes. I suppose I'll have to make arrangements. Thank you for finding her. Anything else I can do for you? No, nothing. Go in grief. Let's return Osric's breastplate. Osric says, let me know how it goes. With the knights, Arismital asks, Is this the armor you wanted? Osric wavers a moment in disbelief. He looks at you then back at the breastplate. He reaches for it slowly, as if expecting it to disappear before he can touch it. How did you manage this? Arismital says, Penhelm, listened to reason. Osric shakes his head. I've never known Penhelm to listen to reason, even from one as persuasive as you. But you've recovered it just the same, here. Osric reaches into his pocket. I think you'll find it more than fair. When you get the chance, stop by Sonil's shop on the other side of the hall. She sells some of the best gear in the city and I'll see that she opens her inventory to you. Arismita asks, What's this armor to you anyway? Osric looks around, trying to appear casual. Ah, oh, it's nothing really, just a keepsake. Osric tries to look you in the eye, but when he does, he appears to reconsider. He sighs. It commemorates the order of Magran, Highest order of valor, awarded to the dead, never the living. Us dear woodens, real dear woodens. We don't have nobility or birthrights, unless you're some copper effer from Aydir. All we've got is the honor we bring to our family name. Eder says, 
The odor of magranis, well, they don't give it out too much. Not often you see a member of the dozens whose revolutionary ties are as good as he says they are. So that means what? That means Osric is a descendant of the original dozens? Hmm. Oh no no, I I I misunderstood Eder's words. It just means that Osric is a descendant of those who fought. For for Deerwood, I guess. For Deerwood's independence. So that and that was 150 years ago, right? There's a long history. A, a breastplate that spans three generations. Osric says, so this, he pauses, considering the weathered metal, a pale image of its former self, but still catching the light, is something to live up to. Got business with me? Farewell. Sonil says, so the wilds haven't claimed you yet, she smiles, good to see you again, Alice Mittel says, show me your wares. Mercenary says, best bounty that's come up in a long while, and guess who steals it out from under me? Bini, that rotten bastardo. Is it Bini or Bine? Mercenary says, at least he didn't kill you. Him and the giant slayers are mean sons of bitches. Bine, okay. Something tells me you'll fit in just fine here. The knights patrol to keep us out of the ruins, but who keeps them out? You look like you've seen a thing or two in the wilds. Some actors are still here, so I guess not all the actors are in on Lumdala's, um, side business.
Holy looks as Holy looks over as you approach. What did you find? Is Landry living the high life with his respectable job and fancy woman? Aris Mito says Landry's dead. Oli says, well, if that don't just. His hand tightens around his cup and he looks away. I told that Claude to enjoy the simple life, but he got these high-minded ideas. Couldn't stop thinking about how things might be different. Look, thanks for telling me, I guess. Oli takes a gulp from his drink. I'm going to need a ne I'm going to need a few more of these. Aris Mittal says, get yourself cleaned up and get out of here, and gives Oli 50 CP. Oli looks at the coins on the table, no promises but maybe after this one. Oli raises his glass to you and takes a drink. Gods keep you. Eliga, Elja says, I was hoping I'd see you soon. Found anything yet? Aris Mittal says, I'm afraid I have bad news. Kendall is dead. Elja lets out a breath. I see. Pity, anger, and sadness flicker across her face, almost too quickly to distinguish. I knew that woman was trouble. She seems lost in thought for several seconds. Aris Mittal asks, Are you okay? Elja dabs at her eye and barks with a sharp laugh. Oh, of course, like I said, it was nothing serious to me. It's just sad to think of someone so young. Finally, she turns back to you. I appreciate you coming to tell me. I think I need some time to myself right now. I'm fine really, just thinking back about a few things. What, about all those nights that he's dicking you? In a good way, I mean. Well, 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 Lord Gaderman. Well met, friend. Lord Gaderman's robes are of a simple, modest cut. Unlike the nobles around him, he wears only one gold ring, 
He looks at you with a kind and welcoming expression. So, you're the newcomer who's been so busy around the Fines Bay. It's a pleasure to meet you. Addis Mittal says, asks, who are you? Lord Gaderman says, I'm a noble here in Breckenbury, but please don't judge me too harshly. He laughs. My forebears were successful merchants in the days of Duke Hadret, and I have the honor of heading philanthropic projects in the current administration. I spend a lot of my time out here trying to get my peers more involved in charity work, but many of them only set foot in Ondra's gift to visit that brothel. Aris Mittal says, I know about your involvement with the Revel of Stars. Lord Gaderman says, You what? A sheen of sweat appears on his smooth forehead. Ah, gods, look, I know it sounds heinous, but please, hear me out. Aris Mittal says, Say your peace. Lord Gaderman pauses. When he speaks again, his voice sounds dry and cracked. It's a sickness, some evil, polluting my soul. I've tried everything, but watching Lumdala's performances soothes me in ways those treatments at the sanitarium never can. His eyes are distant, transfixed. There's something about watching a person's last moments, seeing the instant the soul departs for the next life. When I was young, I'd go hunting with my father and watch deer fall to his arrows, but now... His face contorts in bitterness. The gods, in their infinite wisdom, made me this way. I manage my condition the best I can, and meanwhile I help the less fortunate. Whatever I can do to pay this penalty on my soul. I don't expect you to condone my actions, but don't turn me in. I have to believe that one day, if I continue to work for the greater good, the gods will remove this burden from me. For as many people as I've hurt, I've helped a hundred more. Aris Mittal says, what else can I do? Someone has to pay for this. What? Someone has to pay for this? You mean framing? Oh ma. Aris Mittal says, Ma. He asked me to not turn him in. Mm. Mm. Aris Mittal says, make it worth my while. Lord Gaderman says, yes, of course. Gaderman pulls a bag of coppers from his belt. I trust this will be enough. I should leave town for a bit, clear my head. Let this whole thing blow over, he meets your eye. Thank you for giving me this chance. One day I swear, I'll be worthy of it. Good day, stranger. Kuren picks up his ears, back with news perhaps. Aris Mittal says, what are you so busy with? 
Kuren's small furry hands gesture expansively at the papers before him, hollow-born, growing unrest, and the ever-present political intrigues, with so many missing souls, missing persons are the least of our concerns these days. Okay, so Laura was right. Her sentiment was right. The authorities don't, don't really care, is it? Kuren says, what brings you to Dunrit Row? Aris Mittal says, I was invited here by Lady Webb. Kuren cocks his head to one side, as if trying to get a better look at you. Forgive me, she doesn't take many visitors, but the ones she does invite are a fascinating lot. I've always marveled at her choices. Nothing in common to my eyes, but her sight is far keener than mine. I wonder what it is she sees. Her room is upstairs, the one with the guards out front. The city may not understand her value, but the Duke certainly does. Iris Mittal says, I found the missing people. I found the missing people. Kuren says, yes, you've been all over Defiance Bay since last we spoke. His alert eyes search you. What did you find? Okay, how can I justify option number three? Regarding Lumdala, I told her that I would let her go, yes, but I never, but I never promised her that I will not tell Dunrit Ro about her actions. However, Lord Gatherman, he asked to not turn him in. Well, technically, Aris Mittal doesn't break the deal. Aris did not turn Gaderman in. He simply informed Kuren of the whole event, down to the detail of the characters involved. So yes, Aris Mittal says a lot, actually. A woman named Lumdala has been staging performances in which actors are murdered. Lord Gaderman is one of her most prominent patrons. Kuren hisses, something big, I knew it, I'll send my men after them right away. You've been a resourceful investigator, and your shrewdness has helped resolve a most troublesome case, and saved many lives, I'm sure. Aris Mittal says about my payment. Kuren says, of course. You've certainly saved us a lot of work. Here, take this. Aris Mittal says, Finding those people wasn't easy. Surely my help was worth more than that. Kuren says, I'm authorized to give you a little more. Kuren scratches behind an ear. Without your help, this would have sat on the books for a very long time. Welcome! Kuren says, always a pleasure to see a clever friend. He returns to sorting through the scrolls on the table. Must be here somewhere. Aris Mittal says, farewell. <laughs>